be well at the end. Thank you. I'm uh, welcoming now on stage uh, Mel Johnson from the FA. Uh, he will deliver a presentation on the FA uh, certification strategy for electrical vertical takeoff and landing. Please, Mel. Well, good morning, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, first of all, uh, great thanks to uh, IASA for the invitation to come and uh, um, to this conference and being able to have a chance to present. I very much appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, my name is Mel Johnson. I am the Director of Compliance and Airworthiness and Aircraft Certification uh, for the FAA, and my division has responsibility for uh, the uh, domestic certification of aircraft in the United States as well as uh, the um, uh, validation of products from um, Europe and other, and other um, countries. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, um, we're all in, in this uh, together to try to help promote safety, and I appreciate the collaboration and the work that we have uh, to do with our um, bilateral partners um, with, the, with the ASA. Um, you know, uh, the fact is that um, uh, we have a tremendous amount of in innovation going on in the, in the industry right now, and um, in particular in the eVTOL sector. Um, also, um, with, with all the different names that we have for it, uh, um, some people call it advanced air mobility. And we're watching it take shape right now, and it's been uh, fascinating to um, try to begin, um, stay up to, sp up, to, up to speed and get um, ready for the innovation that's coming. So it's great to be amongst all of you um, to be able to talk a little bit about our uh, the international approach that we'll be taking in this transformative um, um, t time frame. So um, t you know I look at today's uh, discussion as a continuation of the of the work that was uh, um, that we've been uh, partnering with. Uh, just a few months ago, I was uh, at the Vertical Air, um, Aviation Safety Team conference that vast that was held in um, Texas, and had the privilege to speak there as well. I'm very proud of uh, the FAA and, the divi and my division in particular um, as we were able to support that um, conference and help bring together government, industry, and international representatives to discuss vertical aviation safety. And what was particularly impressive was the support we received from our European colleagues. Um, we had many representatives there from EASA, from the European rotorcraft industry, from, EV from the eVTOL industry that flew, very, uh, flew over to help us help out and join in with that conference. So it's a quite an honor to be able to be part of, the, um, of the, this continuing international work. And I'm glad I get a chance to um, be able to be part of the, of, of the work that's going on here. And so there's lots to celebrate from regulation um, and technological advances, to infrastructure improvements, partnerships, partnerships across um, sectors and, and boundaries. Um, events such as uh, the European Rotor, Rotors affords us the opportunity to get deep into the uh, many aspects that is uh, um, keeping us all engaged um, at our, in our businesses. Um, so let's talk about a little bit um, uh, about some of the, um, the work, not in just eVTOL, but in Rotorcraft in particular. So just uh, some of the things that um, have um, been going on um, in the FA. Um, you may have heard about some important safety improvements that have happened in the past five years. In June 2017, we released the safety continuum for Part 27 normal category rotorcraft systems um, and, um, and, the, and a policy statement. Some of the notable results of this policy statement is a significant increase in the certification of single engine IFR, low cost autopilots and visual uh, for um, VFR and introduction of safety display features such as helicopter train awareness warning systems and automatic de um, dependent surveillance broadcast, ADSB in and out. And for those unfamiliar with this policy statement, it sets a class of normal category aircraft, uh, rotorcraft um, to establish a graduated scale for certification standards for systems and equipment. Um, the classes were based on aircraft weight, engine type and count, and, oc and occupant capacity for rotorcraft weighing up to 7,000 pounds. The safety continuum concept was launched to encourage the helicopter community to, um, to embrace advances in systems and equipment technology through a balanced approach to certification that recognizes the safety benefit uh, for installing such technology. This approach has made, um, uh, made technology more affordable and consequently more rotorcraft owners have been um, installing this equipment. And I'd like to note that these improvements in safety directly address the top half of the fa fatal rotorcraft accident causes in the United States loss of control, inadvertent flight into, um, into um, IMC, 
and, uh, and low altitude object strikes. We also have an effort underway to have full fly-by-wire installations on Part 27, Part 27 normal category rotorcraft, and this major advancement for normal um, category aircraft will allow the introduction of safety features such as um, uh, flight envelope protection. So we're seeing positive results in other areas as well. Air ambulance and utility helicopter fatal accident rates have been dropping since 2019, and it's a trend that we wel welcome. So there are challenges. Um, you know, we still have uh, um, uh, the personal private helicopter fatal accident rates have always been a concern and they continue to climb. The overall U.S. fatal accident rate has remained stubbornly steady for several years. And I'm confident the efforts I described earlier are gonna be a part of helping change that. In the United States, um, um, while the United States only had one fatal um, firefighting helicopter accident from 2009 to 2018, there were five from 2019 to 2021. Firefighting has been increasingly um, in demand with wildfires in the Western United States. The FAA is committed to making helicopter firefighting as safe as possible. In the United States, we have a helicopter pilot and uh, mechanic shortage. The FAA has several outreach efforts to encourage young people to consider aviation careers. Back in, two, in 1961, the FAA started to um, and, uh, and established a science, technology, energy, engineering, and math um, and space education program that called STEM AVSED. Um, that was to try to help inspire the next generation of skilled professionals for aviation and aerospace communities. And today, from our um, Aviation Career um, Education Academy and science fairs to get lectures and, and hands-on hands workshops, um, this program um, is a, a, um, provides a path um, to help um, kids um, see the high-flying um, careers that can happen in aviation and aerospace. The Rotocraft Collective is another successful example of U.S. industry and FA working together. Um, the group produces safety videos aimed at Rotocraft community, and I would urge you to um, take a look at those. Um, so, you know, we've been um, talking a little bit about uh, um, traditional Rotocraft, but um, because of managing safety and other issues are, that I've talked about are very important, we especially see the introduction of eVTOL aircraft entering the U.S. Um, space as an important safety um, um, effort. The eVTOL segment will continue to take an increase significant within the aviation sector. It's an industry that's welcome, that, that we welcome. Uh, to the electrical vertical uh, takeoff and landing community here at this conference, I'd like to say how much we uh, um, appreciate you and, and um, are excited to have you part of the aviation community. We look forward to learning about dynamic and innovative products and aircraft that you have underway and, we're, and, um, and that you're on the frontier of new technology. And this conference will help showcase some of, the, of those. As many of you already know, eVTOL is all about convenience and speed. Another great feature is that eVTOL typically does not require additional ro roads, railroads, airports, and the electric um, engines that uh, make these aircraft quieter and more sustainable. These factors combine for big wins for the environment and for the residents of our cities. The depth and breadth of this industry is staggering. Companies in the United States are looking um, to create um, urban air taxis that can fly above heavy traffic and get people quickly to destinations. Meanwhile, a Vermont um, company is uh, um, working with plans to uh, uh, create a network of charging state stations for um, eVTOL. In Massachusetts, there's a company that's working on hydrogen fuel cell um, eVTOLs. And let's not forget uh, NASA's solar-powered helicopter, Ingenuity, which represents uh, the first uh, rotorcraft that flew on another planet. Um, it's important to stress that safety is the cornerstone of everything the FAA does. So I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss uh, um, what, uh, we, um, uh, what will likely change for air travel in the foreseeable future. First of all, the FAA um, is going to take an, a risk-based approach to um, certifying eVTOL. We plan to approach eVTOL not only as a single technology, but a collective of new and emerging, t emerging t technologies in aviation. This approach will involve applying um, existing airworthiness standards where the risks um, are um, posed are similar to tr traditional aircraft. However, we are well aware of the differences um, um, that exist, and the FAA has, um, will use proven methods for ensuring the safety of these complex systems. Uh, much of our approach will be guided by regulations that took effect back in 2017 in our um, uh, Part 23, Amendment 64 um, uh, uh, requirements. Um, it um, established several goals. First, it created an, an, an approach that applies to a, an appro appropriate level certification rigor commensurate with the proposed risk. Two, it's, um, it sets a safety objective that fosters innovation and technology adaptation. 
And third, it replaces prescriptive rules with performance-based regulations. And then fourth, it, it is used, um, uses consensus standards to clarify how safety objectives can be used, uh, can be met with specific, for specific designs and technologies. Through this approach, we plan to define um, powered lift uh, um, uh, uh, through, a, um, through our, um, our, our certification processes. Um, these aircraft um, depend principally on um, engine-driven lift devices for vertical um, takeoff and landing and, um, and non-rotating airfoils for horizontal flight. Uh, we define uh, uh, the, the FAA is, is currently working with eVTOL projects that are um, in this powered lift category and others that are um, also rotorcraft. Both are going through the FAA certification pro process based on FAA regulation that I just mentioned, and we'll designate them as special class aircraft. Um, existing projects that were started um, um, earlier uh, as, a, um, as part of the regulatory framework in 2117A, in other words, uh, uh, normal category air, aircraft are being converted into uh, 2117B uh, in the, uh, as a special class. Um, we'll be using the uh, requirements and uh, the performance requirements of amendment, um, Part 23, Amendment 64, um, and we'll supplement those requirements with uh, project-specific considerations to um, take up the, um, the technology uh, proposed by, by the um, vertical takeoff and landing and the transition um, um, aspects. Um, a key tenet of the FAA's approach uh, to eVTOL is that the method of compliance must be accepted by the FAA. We recognize um, that the method of compliance acceptable for traditional aircraft might not be appropriate for eVTOL, and due to configuration differences, complexity, and novel technologies, we'll be accommodating these differences as we work with individual applicants. Um, so the FAA is utilizing these current projects to establish the groundwork for future, publish, uh, for future policy and rulemaking. And this holistic effort, the FAA is coordinating the development of certification requirements with airspace, infrastructure, and operational requirements. So while I talked a little bit about eVTOL, the FAA also recognizes the crucial role that helicopters play in our society. Helicopters and their crews um, rescue people worldwide from sinking boats, they transport workers to oil rigs, they take uh, presidents and prime ministers and other leaders to, uh, to high-level meetings. People are alive today because of the swift action of helicopter medical crews after vehicle accidents. So I want to focus on what we can all do to um, help improve rotorcraft safety, especially in the area of rotorcraft occupant protection. The FAA has been focused, uh, has, a, a, has, um, um, has, has been in a focus area for nearly a decade. And in, 19, uh, in 2020, or 2018, uh, F, the FAA Reauthorization Act um, provided requirements uh, to the FAA. Um, as of April 5th, 2020, um, they all have to be uh, equipped with crash-resistant fuel systems. So it's a great start. However, we need to address the existing rotorcraft fleet. A substantial percentage of the fleet would benefit from incorporation of design enhancements to reduce post-crash fires. We have increased our use of special airworthiness information bulletins, um, known as SAIBs, to help uh, uh, improve the occupant protection and help avoid accidents in the first place. As part of the Rotorcraft safety promotion concept, the SAIBs kicked off in April or September of 2021 with an SAIB um, um, explaining uh, information on how to prevent bird strikes. The FAA's strategic policy for rotorcraft section, formerly known as the Rotorcraft Standards Branch, plans to issue SIBs through 2023 with the next SAIB focused on crash-worthy fuel systems. And we haven't forgotten about our rulemaking to address um, the rotorcraft occupant protection. While we um, work to make this rulemaking a priority, we have been at very active in promoting and encouraging voluntary safety design enhancements for the existing fleets. And we'd ask industry to play a bigger role in improving rotorcraft safety through voluntary compliance. Voluntary compliance versus a more deliberate and lengthy rulemaking process provides greater flexibility in addressing, uh, uh, in addressing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the range of safety issues at hand. The U.S. Helicopter Safety Team represents a valuable resource that promotes voluntary measures in areas of safety equipment, operations, and maintenance. And so this team is a great example of how industry and government can work together um, to help promote safety. So many of our industry colleagues work alongside the FAA counterparts um, to thoughtfully plan and develop and make um, available information that will help um, promote safety. The U.S. Um, helicopter safety team also develops and promotes data-driven helicopter safety enhancements or steps that the industry can voluntarily implement. 
And I'd encourage you to um, take a look at the U.S. Helicopter Safety Team website and take advantage of the many resources there. So in conclusion, there's a, a tons of work that we have um, left to, um, to go. There's so many of you here that are investing uh, in, in, the new, in new technology and trying to help promote safety. Together, we can mitigate these risks together, um, trying to find the optimal level of safety um, uh, that the public has at interest. And, we, and all of us have a lot to boast about. Um, we've got a, a bright future ahead of us. I hope to, we can walk away today with an uh, uh, increased sense of confidence that we're going to continue that collaboration and working together. As we work together for the, finding that optimal level of safety uh, for um, compliance uh, uh, to the regulations and to help promote um, the, the vertical lift and take uh, the EV tall and rotorcraft industry. Thanks a lot for having me here today and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to be a participant in this conference. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mel Johnson.